so Kevin, you've been um, just doing experimenting around a little bit with um, the O1, the new model, and uh, as a person that does research, maybe you can comment on um, what your you, what you think this represents in terms of the slope of the line uh, towards uh, uh, what Leopold describes. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. And and Leo, this this is such an awesome, I call it a book, it's not an essay. Like I've sent it to many policymakers because it really lays out uh, uh, kind of fundamentals. Even if you stop when you say superintelligence, read up to that point and you're more informed than most of the marks. And so the reason is that when people see these in the real world, not people here, people in the real world, they play with a model. It can't do everything they want it to do. And so they think, I don't really see the use case. Like most organizations are not using AI at all, including me and a J's org, uh, organization where we work at University of Toronto. So why is because it's very difficult to extrapolate forward on um, performance. And what's nice about AI is some aspects of performance we can extrapolate forward on and make predictions. So for example, um, Leo in the essay talks about the GPQA, uh, biology, physics, chemistry benchmark. This is this is from June, 2024. Leo is like outrageously, outrageously optimistic. And he said, we're like one or two generations away from hitting the human 80% performance. Like in September, we passed it. <laughs> it's like three months later. Um, and the same mathematical derivation, I would have said six months ago, I'm hoping in the next couple of years, um, uh, we're able to handle this properly. Like I can't imagine today writing a paper without having uh, oh, one, look at my proofs as I'm going. Like it's already at that level. It's better than my, my graduate assistants. Um, and so if you think through like where are we headed here, I think one way to think about oh, one is I've got these technical limits, compute, the data I use to train on, uh, advancements, advances in our model, the costs, and this is another algorithmic improvement, the speed, that's another algorithmic improvement or, or improvement on chips. Um, unhobbling, as, as, as uh, Leo calls it, or, uh, on inference. And what you saw with O1 basically is that a little bit of reinforcement learning on chain of thought um, actually offers like another multiplicative factor that could Im improve the performance of an, of an LLM. And I think the last thing I want to say is the LLM part's really important here, especially the chain of thought. So Wittgenstein uh, has a very famous line that Grenze meine Sprache bedeuten die Grenze uh, meine Welt is like the limits of uh, my language are the limits of my world. So what he means by that is I can't describe as a human um, things that I can't put into language is how I think. And it's a really interesting question. Uh, first, are LMs, because they can interpret language, that makes certain types of reinforcement learning uh, or chain of thought easier. So it allows models to self-reflect uh, self even when in a particular use case, we don't have a good reward function. And that opens up huge potential for improvements of the type that we've seen um, with O1 this week. And the second thing that I think is an open question, I'm curious what Leo would say about this, is do does AI need to do this? Is the language somewhat fundamental for doing inference? Is there a reason that humans have evolved to think through problems in a linguistic form in, in order to like sort of capture things that have happened in the past when considering new problems? Or is there some way to compress the model even more and skip that intermediate step? In which case we have another big algorithmic improvement and how fast AI can move. Uh, thank you very much for the paper, Leo. Really enjoyed it.